Panasonic 7200 70 millimeter 2.8 stabilization off. Today I'm going to do a handheld stabilization test comparing the L mount Panasonic 7200 millimeter f2.8 lens with the original Canon EF mount 7200 f2.8 L lens. I'll also be using each brand's two times teleconverter to cover all our bases. As I get into the test, I'll be demonstrating no stabilization, post-production stabilization, lens stabilization, camera body stabilization, and various combinations of the mentioned list. Without further ado, here we go. Here's the Panasonic lens at 70 millimeters without stabilization. Pretty shaky, generally unusable, until you put warp stabilizer on it. Then it's quite usable. Here's the same focal length, but with optical image stabilization. I think this works fine if going for a typical handheld look. Very smooth camera bobbles. With post stabilization, there's a little crop on the image, but now has a very smooth, slight camera drift. This shot is using OIS, which stands for optical image stabilization, and it's also using the strongest setting of in-camera stabilization. When using in-camera stabilization, there's a slight crop on the sensor, just like with using post stabilizing, but you don't have to spend the time processing the footage in post to get a similar effect. When combined with warp stabilizer at this focal length, you basically get a rock solid image. At 200 millimeters with no stabilization, this shot looks terrible, but let's see what happens when we put warp stabilizer on it. Yeah, you might be able to get this shot to pass if it's only on screen for a second, or the viewer is looking at it on a small phone screen, but the top of the image starts doing some weird judder and looks pretty bad. Maybe if you're shooting with a global sensor camera, this wouldn't be an issue. With OIS turned on, it looks like a decent handheld shot a few seconds after hitting the record button. Sure, there's some wobble, but that's kind of what you expect with a handheld shot. Note that if there are any rolling shutter issues, they aren't visible when watching. As I would expect, when turning on warp stabilizer, it becomes a very smooth shot. The tops of the buildings no longer have a judder effect like in the previous shot. At 200 millimeters, using OIS and in-body stabilization, we start to see some abrupt direction changes from what I assume is the sensor hitting the limits of what it can stabilize in body. Better than no stabilization, as usual, warp stabilizer helps things out. Now shooting at the equivalent of 400 millimeters with no stabilization looks absolutely awful. With warp stabilizer turned on, it arguably looks worse. It also cropped in a ton on the image. One thing to note, I'm using the default warp stabilizer settings on Premiere 2020. Even when turning down the smoothness from 50% to 5%, checking the detailed analysis box and the enhanced rolling shutter correction box, it's still unusable. Plus it took about eight minutes to analyze this 30 second clip. Off the bat with OIS, you've got a usable handheld shot. Unfortunately, post stabilization cropped the heck out of the image and some rolling shutter issues show up at the top of the frame. I still think it's usable and you could argue the rolling shutter is just atmospheric disturbances or heat blur at this focal length. When we throw all the physical instances of stabilization at the 400mm image, it does a pretty good job. It's got some micro jitter, but nothing terrible. After applying warp, it cleans up really well. Moving on to an older lens, this is the non-stabilized version of the Canon 70-200 f2.8 L-series. Here's a quick control showing no stabilization at 70mm. This shot really blew me away when I turned on the in-camera stabilization. It took a lens that was virtually worthless for shooting anything handheld in video mode and turned it into a usable tool. 
I know there are people out there who say that in-body stabilization is a gimmick and you should always use the right support equipment. While I agree that you should always use the right support equipment like tripods, monopods, or gimbals, sometimes you just don't have the time or extra help to lug all that stuff around. In these cases, body stabilization isn't a gimmick. Here's a quick shot of warp applied, even though the shot didn't need it. At 200mm with no stabilization, again, the shot is unusable until warp stabilizer is applied. Within body stabilization, you'll find a few seconds of a usable shot. When I only had a Canon C100 for video, I would never put this particular lens on the camera even when using a tripod. If I were to slightly touch the camera, the whole image would shake. When using a GH5 or newer camera with body stabilization, this becomes a totally acceptable lens. Here's with warp applied. Looks great. At 400mm equivalent, this image looks terrible without any stabilization. With post stabilization, the image surprisingly becomes even less usable. With in-body stabilization turned on, the image is way better than no stabilization, but still not great. When warp is turned on, the image goes from maybe being passable to usable without any issues. Now if you're still not convinced that stabilization helps, since all real professionals use tripods or support equipment on paying shoots, here's a test showing a lockdown tripod with winds blowing between 15 and 20 miles per hour. Even with warp stabilizer, there's some rolling shutter issues. Turning on OIS helps out a ton in this situation. Warp stabilizer makes the image rock solid. It looks like when the camera's on a tripod, combining OIS with in-body stabilization actually makes things a little worse. Although post-production stabilizes that issue. Well, that's all I've got for this video. While this isn't a scientific test, it does show how important acquiring a good image from the get-go is. Post-stabilization does have its place and has saved me many times, but if you can capture a smooth image from the start, you'll spend less time in post, and the images that do need smoothing will generally turn out better.